Welcome, welcome. I'm your host, Stefano, and this is Will Leaders Talk, a podcast about leadership, but most importantly, about leaders. This is episode one, and we have our very special first guest, Curtis Minder. Curtis is a cybersecurity specialist. He's the CEO and founder of the company called GroupSense, who, of course, operates in cybersecurity. But he also the founder of the organization, non-profit organization, Good Sense, still in cybersecurity. He's not just a leader in cybersecurity, he is also a public speaker. You can watch him on YouTube and many other channels. There is a very recent TEDx uh, video where he explains what is a ransomware and how important it is to be protected by, you know, from ransomwares and how to do it. Other than this, Curtis is a motorcyclist, a hiker, a very fit person, very focused on health and fitness in general. And he will, during the interview, explain how he approaches these different sectors. From leaving a company and going through pandemic to leading the chapter, the BMW chapter in Washington DC and organizing rallies and meetups and these kind of things to personal leadership when actually he takes ownership of his own life. Well, the thing that you will learn from Curtis is to ask why as many times as you can until you get the nugget, until you get the core, until you get the right answer. I hope you will enjoy this, uh, this episode, at least as much as I enjoy recording it. And uh, well, remember to subscribe and you, will, you can follow me also on YouTube, TikTok, LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram. I will post the link in the description of the episode. All right, so enjoy. So welcome, welcome to the first episode of When Leaders Talk and a special welcome to Curtis Minder, our first guest here. So welcome Curtis and thank you for being with us. Yeah, it's an honor to be the first guest. I'm excited. <laughs> Yeah, well, this is going to be like a nice breaker for the both of us, I guess, you know, and it's going to be, it's going to be fun. I'm sure it's going to be fun. I see that I'll you be, are I'll in the a room. good, uh, I'll be a good beta test. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> I see, I see that you are in a room with a lot of things, you know, like uh, the bicycle and uh, the, the motorbike and the uh, books and things. So, and this, I guess that this um, room is telling a lot about you. And... <laughs> But we will discover more, right? Because we don't care about the motorbike. What we care is about leadership. And that's all we're going to talk about today. Okay. So are you ready? I'm ready. Just a little bit about motorcycles would be good, though. If we could break that down. <laughs> okay. <a> okay. <laughs> leadership on a motorcycle. Sure. <laughs> exactly. I know actually you are very active on the side, right? You organize meetups and rides and more than that. So there is a kind of leadership actually on that, right? Yeah, well, yes. And I was also the president of the um, BMW motorcycle chapter in Washington, DC for a couple of years. I ran a, okay. a rally, a very large motorcycle rally uh, called the Square Root Rally for, for a number of years in Maryland as well. So there's you, it requires some uh, leadership slash organizational skills to pull that off. Yeah. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Absolutely. So we can go through it. That's, that's no problem. We don't have any boundaries other than time. So, right. okay, let's, let's start. The first question I want to ask is the starting point is, do you have a definition of leadership? And if you have it, would you share it with us? Hmm. Well, I'm shooting from the hip here. <laughs> <laughs> Because, I, you know, I, I don't have the Webster's Dictionary in front of me to give you the official definition. But in, in my mind, I mean, just in practice, I think um, it is setting sort of a, a tone uh, for an organization or, or a group of people for uh, sort of values, direction, and um, also setting an example of how to achieve those things, those values and, 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 and things like that. So um, it... It's also very iterative over time, I've learned. Like, so having run the company now for eight years, uh, I, I've recognized so many mistakes. Uh, and so you, you're constantly learning and improving and, and, and trying to get better. Um, 
but yes, I think it's setting the tone for how uh, what the, what the values and direction of an organization is, uh, and then also setting the example of how to achieve those things. Oh, that's great. You touch upon so many things that are of interest, and we're going to explore, we're going to go deeper in, uh, in the few things that you say, actually, in the many things that you already said. Okay. And I want to start, you know, you mentioned already that you launched your, your company, Group Sense, now eight years ago. And, you know, normally founders have the privilege, if you want, to set the culture of the company. Can you Tell us a little bit more about it. Is it a privilege or is it a curse? <laughs> <laughs> Both. Um, you know, yes. And, and, and frankly, one of the reasons why I did start the company at all uh, was because I wanted to surround myself with people who had similar values. Um, and uh, so the culture from the very beginning was important to me. Uh, as it, 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 as important as the desired outcome or the or the or the compensation, um, the the culture of the company was one of the very reasons I started it. And I can say that in the beginning, uh, you know, when when you're very small, this this company was not venture backed. We didn't raise a bunch of uh, capital. We didn't you know we didn't hire 50 people at once. We hired one person at a time as we uh, sort of. Um, you know, got more customers, we hired more, and it was all sort of cash flow driven. And as a result, um, in the beginning, it's a little bit easy to control those things, uh, you know, to, <laughs> to, to, to influence the, the culture as the company gets bigger <laughs> um, and you insert other levels of management and things like that, it becomes increasingly uh, more difficult to maintain. Um, I will say that the, the way, even in the beginning, while, while it's easier to control, you can you can mess that up very quickly as well based on whom you hire. So I, I would say if I was going to attribute some early mistakes, I would say that we probably made some hires that weren't <laughs> ideal for the culture we desired, and we hadn't quite figured out like the the, the litmus test or or how to interview and determine that fit. Uh, it probably took us a few years to figure that out, um, you know, to get that really dialed in, I guess. Um, and so we we struggled in the beginning. We did. Well, but you know, and you say another word that is is very important for me, and that is values. You know, I, you you say that you have a hire people who are not aligned to the values of the company, right? So, which are the values that you know the most important values in group sense? You could say that the the most important values. Um, are in group sense are also, you know, the most important values to me as a person. So, um, you know, honesty and transparency is, 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 uh, you know, dishonesty in my mind, in, in my personal life, but also, uh, at work is a cardinal sin. Um, you, you cannot work with someone you cannot trust. And, uh, so the, the, I, I believe that transparency and honesty are among the top most important values. Um, I think, Self awareness, um, in 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 everyone, not just the the employees, but also in me, right? And, and self awareness is key because without that, um, you 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 can inadvertently be dishonest, right? You don't mean to be dishonest, but you can if you're not self aware, you can inadvertently be dishonest with yourself and with with the team. Um, and and frankly, you can't improve much if you're not self aware. <laughs> So uh, <laughs> primarily honesty and transparency, yeah. Okay, okay, honesty and transparency. But I want to add something because, you know, I was curious, of, of course, and now on the internet you can find a lot of information, including feedbacks from the employees. And there was one employee who say, oh, this is the most empathetic environment I've ever worked in. And it was, it was nice to see. So how do you enforce it right? how do you apply empathy uh what, what's your what's your secret if you want um that you know that's complicated because i think uh so one of the things that we do at group sense is is uh we do negotiations with criminals so it's, it's a weird part of the job but the thing that makes us great at that the, the folks on our team that do that is empathy um, and what I've learned is when trying to build out that team, um, it's not a, a, a skill that you can teach. It's, it's, 
or or if if it is, it's it's very difficult. Uh, there are certain personality types that lend themselves very easily to being empathetic and understanding another person person's position. And also, I want to make a distinction because a lot of times this gets in in language it gets mi mixed up. Empathy is not the same as sympathy. <laughs> So no, no, I can absolutely. empathize with, with a criminal. I can empathize with a criminal, meaning I understand their position and where they're coming from and why they are thinking the way they're thinking. Uh, but I, I don't, doesn't mean I, I sympathize with them. <laughs> and so th that's an important distinction. And, and you can apply the same thing to the staff. It's like, look, I understand. I don't agree. <laughs> But well, I, understand. I, I, um, I tell you what, as a potential client, I, I, I'm happy about it. I'm okay with that. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I think, I, think uh, to, I don't know if I answered your question well, but I think that, yeah. that empathy is not something that you can necessarily teach. You can, you can again, going back to the beginning of the, the talk, I mean, you can lead by example um, and, it, you know, show, showing what that is, explaining like you know, I understand why this person is behaving this way. And that's why I'm going to react in this way. Right. And, and, or something similar. And that, that sets an example, but some people are, they're not, they're not going to be able to just do it overnight. Right. Okay. And I want to, I want to start with uh, another word actually is just say that is set the example. What is your example? Do you have like a role model, someone in, in that is living or not, or, probably fictional that you have like it's like a, a yeah like someone that you say oh i want to be like that not exactly not exactly not a single individual i mean i i take a lot of um you know examples from a from a lot of people uh both you know people i know but also people i read about um follow on on social media and things like that um you know for example David Goggins made me do my workout yesterday when I didn't want to. I don't know David Goggins, but he's, I don't know if you, if you know him. He's a, he's a fitness influencer. He, he yelled at me yesterday morning and I got up and did my workout when I didn't really want to. Um, there, there's that kind of tactical stuff. But I mean, I, I, this is a little bit uh, embarrassing, but like when I was growing up, well, I was the world's biggest Prince fan. Okay. Know, you know, the singer Prince. Yeah, of course. And later uh, in my career, I actually got to 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 meet him, and I I worked with him on a project. We we actually launched um, uh, his first e-commerce system to sell his records on the internet. Um, but so I, I I saw him as a fan, and then I saw him as a as a professional and as a business person. I saw both sides of that, and I can say that if if I was going to pick somebody as an example uh, for at least uh, discipline and work ethic. He is definitely that. Um, th that man, <laughs> you know, rest in peace. That man spent uh, every waking hour trying to be better at everything that he did. And <laughs> it made him one of the best at all of those things. Now, he was not, he had no work life balance. He had no personal life. He had, you know, he was a complete nerd, right? All he did was sit in the basement and learn new guitar chords or whatever forever until he died, right? And so, um, you know, there, there's a there's a lesson there, but uh, it's what I did pick up from from folks like him and other other professionals is, you know, the self awareness, discipline, and drive to be better uh, is a constant thing. It has you do you have to do it every single day uh, of your life um, to get better. Other you're either going getting better or getting worse, right? There's one or the other, so you 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 need to you need to set the trajectory. Self-awareness is something that you have been repeating now for you know, at least two, three times, or even more probably. <laughs> so I, I guess I'm assuming it is important for you. And how do you achieve self-awareness? What is your your what, what do you do to be self-aware to um, get in touch with your inner self? Well, I don't know if you you necessarily achieve it. Um... <clears throat> But you know, it's 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 almost like a, it's like yoga. It's a practice, right? You have to, <laughs> um, and I think also that 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 same sort of um, that same sort of empathy that I use externally, that same tool is sim It's a similar tool that I'd use to look at myself objectively from the outside, um, and uh, I you know it, it's a it's a it's a practice because you can also go overboard. Um, where where you are too self-critical or too um, 
you know, you can, you can be your, own, your biggest critic. I am my own biggest critic most of the time. And, you know, you have to recognize what you're doing well is also, it is like, yes, I could be better at this, but I, I'm, I'm doing these things really well because of my hard work. Um, but I do think one of the most dangerous things in the world, professionally or otherwise, is to lie to yourself. That's one of the most dangerous things in the world. <laughs> and uh, and that's that's how you end up with sociopaths and, and egomaniacs and things like that. Well, so. then, yeah, and, and I guess it's, a lot, I think a lot of people at the end, you know, they don't understand how important it is to be truthful to themselves and understand how, uh, get in, how to get in touch with, with uh, their inner self is really, a, I describe it as a, like a, the starting point to success. Uh, yeah. Apparently, you know, you are you are there. The, 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 the funny the funny part is that you say is for you is kind of an external point of view and to look at yourself. And then and that's uh, that's a, I think a beautiful way to put it. You know, because normally when you think about self awareness, it's more like an internal view. But it's, I like the the external part as as well because you are able to judge, not critic too much your behavior. All right. Yeah. And I mean, it, it is also internal. You're correct. And, and as far as tools, I mean, you did ask, you know, what do I do to achieve it? I do. Um, I have, I, for the last, uh, probably almost 15 years, I've had a pretty rigid practice of, um, you know, a fitness routine, but also meditation, uh, and, and journaling. And I think the, the journaling part is, is key to the self-awareness because when you write something down, even if it's easy to flip in thoughts, but when you write it down and you're, and you're writing it to yourself, basically, no one else is going to, nobody else better read my journal. <laughs> That's for me. Um, so I'm writing it to myself. There's something, um, there's something very honest about that. Like, like the, the deliberate writing of the words, you think a little bit more about what you're saying to yourself and how you're saying it. And it, it forces, I think it forces a sort of self-awareness, um, and, and it also, you know, what, what happens to me frequently is, you know, I'll, I'll write something that I experienced and, and how I was feeling about it. And I, it, it forces a bunch of whys, like why, why? And that, that those whys take you down this sort of self-awareness path. Why, why do you feel that way? And why did you put yourself in that circumstance? Or why were you in that situation to begin with? And can you avoid it? Like, do you, should you avoid it? You ask all these sort of objective questions of yourself and, and it, it forces, it forces the self-awareness, I think. Yeah, it's like a child, you know, a child are known for, uh, for children are known for always asking why, why, why. <laughs> At the end, they're able with their ingenuity to, to, you know, put you like, oh my God, mm, what should I say now? Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. You get, to the, okay. You get to the nuggets, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I was like, oh, what well, now? Okay. Shut up, children. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, let's let's go on. Uh, you, you said something about Prince earlier about uh, you know the balance between life and work. That's another important aspect. You said the Prince basically didn't have any any balance. I mean, he it was his own balance. It's not like right. he didn't have a life. He had the life that he wanted basically. Right. How do yeah. you balance work with your personal life with your family and friends? Poorly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, again, this is, this is part of the self-awareness thing, right? It's a good, it's a good segue because, um, that, that is an area where I, I struggle. Uh, I, I, I tend to, uh, over subscribe myself, um, for good reason, for good reason, you know, all, all the motivation behind most of, of, of what I sign up to do from a work perspective or professional perspective has pure intentions. You know, it's, it's, it's to help the team. It's to, to set an example, it's um, to help nonprofits, or I mean, so help small businesses with my nonprofit. So you know, I get I get personal value from those things, um, but they do take away from you know leisure time. What I what I think oh. I've done, uh, what I what I think I've done well is, uh, or you know, semi well is I work in a lot of personal stuff, kind of in weave it into. Uh, my my daily work. So if I if there's a conference call that I don't have to be on the video, for example, I might take it while I hike around the neighborhood. Um, and my neighborhood is a, I'm in the mountains, so it's it's there's mountains, it's beautiful, and so um, so I'll I'll take that while walking. Um, if if I can, 
uh, and, and I'm actually quite well known for this in the cybersecurity community, I will ride my motorcycle <laughs> to every conference. And so oh. I've ridden my motorcycle from Washington, D.C. to Las Vegas a dozen plus times, right, And to, to go to a conference. And on the way, I'll camp. So when and the thing about camping is usually you don't have a signal. You can't, you, nobody can bother you, really. So it's just you and your book and your journal uh, and uh, sometimes a, a black bear <laughs> or something like that. But uh, um, so I, I, t I, I weave it in. What I've been bad at is taking real time to decompress uh, or vac I haven't taken vacation in years. Uh, and I need to be better at that, I think. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you for your honesty and, and you know showing you once again how self-aware of yourself you are. Um, so you you have this company since 2014 and you went through uh, a dramatic moment like all of us. That is the pandemic. Mm -hmm. How did the pandemic change you as a person and? especially you as the leader and the CEO and founder of GroupSense? You know, that's, that's interesting. I was thinking about this recently because I have two co-founders. One of them is in Miami and the other one is in Calgary. Our office was in Washington, D.C. Well, Arlington, Virginia. So <laughs> forgive the, the D.C. people get mad when I do that. Um, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're very jealous. DC is like this. And it... Right, right. Um, so, you know, there's a river. I get it. Okay. So, <laughs> um, the one of the, I think, challenges I had, I won't call it a mistake, is because we bootstrapped the business, we didn't raise capital, we didn't have a lot, um, we couldn't hire. At the, at the beginning, anyway, we could not afford to hire industry leading people for the positions. So we were hiring sort of junior level people, often right out of college and training them up, right? And they were coming to the office in DC. Now, you know, in the early days, uh, you know, we didn't really have a middle management or anything like that. So what the, the challenge that created for me was it is extremely difficult to be both a manager, a daily manager, and a leader. There's, there's, there are different things, right? <laughs> and to be the person that is, you know, is sort of tactically addressing a like work product, but also setting the vision to be that same person is really hard. And what COVID did, what the pandemic did, did is it closed the office. <laughs> so I was going to the office every day as the manager and the leader of the company, but it closed the office. And everybody had to go remote, and it, it changed it, it changed my ability to separate the daily sort of um, management of the team uh, to m more of the leadership uh, sort of visionary role that I should be playing at this point in the company. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but that that certainly uh, changed it. Also, I changed where I lived. I moved from Washington D.C. area to uh, Western Colorado. That's part of that work life. A balance thing. I was trying to find any, any way to, to break free of um, when I what and it was particularly bad in, in DC because I lived uh, walking distance from the office and I didn't own a car and all, my my life it basically consisted of me walking to the office, working all day, walking to the coffee shop afterwards, working till dinner, going home, eating, going to bed, and then getting up and doing it again. And so that routine, you know, just became automatic. And I did that for literally years. And uh, so now I have a little bit more ability to separate my 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 personal um life from work a little bit <laughs> i'm trying to improve on it <laughs> okay so how do you how do you manage the team remotely how can you spread your vision and keep them working together it's What's hard the alchemy um, how do you yeah it's difficult first i'll say one of the one of the biggest things one of the biggest hurdles to overcome with the fully remote work is, you know, when you, before the, before this pandemic and before the shift of remote work, when you joined a new, you left a company and you joined a new company, it was an event. Like you, you went to their office, you met people, you probably, even if they're the headquarters or someplace else, they fly you there and you go there for two weeks and then the staff would go out to happy hours with you and you became sort of ingrained into the culture. It was like, you know, it, there was an event. Uh, now, 
if you go from company A to company B, you, you yesterday you walked to your desk, you sat down, you're at company A. Today you walk to your desk, you sat down, you're at company B. There's no event. There's no seg, uh, sequitur for for that. Um, and so we we try to create that in a couple of ways. One, we, we you know we we created um, sort of a, a mentorship program for with somebody that, that's been for a while. We also created a welcome package. So everybody gets a welcome package. Says welcome to group sense. Got a handwritten note from me. It has you know all of the the swag with the logos and all the stuff like that. Um, and uh, so that, that's one hurdle that's difficult to overcome. I don't know that those compensating controls are are actually adequate, but they're better than nothing. Um, uh, but then the rest of it is 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 you know regular touch points, both professional and for example, we have. Um, we do, we have like on online gaming that we do together. The team does together. Uh, occasionally we have a, a virtual happy hour every week that people come to and, um, you know, actually seldom are, is alcohol consumed because it, you know, we're usually all still working <laughs> while we're talking, but making, <laughs> you know, trying to replace that social component. Um, uh, we do destination, uh, team meetups in person. So, but we do it on a team by team basis. So the software engineering team does one. And the analyst team does one, and the executive team does one. Um, we haven't done a, a, a all hands yet. Plus, we have um, I don't I don't know if I mentioned this to you, but we have an office in in Europe as well, and so it's difficult to include oh, those folks. Wow. Time difference and all this other stuff. So it's it's um, it's been hard. But I I do I do I will say that it's mostly been positive. Like I I, I we've seen no um, real sort of decline in productivity. Uh, morale seems pretty good. Uh, our our um, sort of attrition is is the same as it was when we had an office. People, you know, after a few years, tend to go someplace else. But we, you know, as a startup, you know, it's it's unusual to keep people for five, six years, and a lot of our staff have been with us for that long, um, which is awesome, right? And they're still with us in the remote scenario. Yeah. So the feedback you have it from the employees uh, and the others is, is still like, they, they are motivated and attached to the company and they, they like it. And yeah. then this, I would say that in, in, a, in a period like this, it's, it's, it's a great achievement, trust me. <laughs> so congratulations on that. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Oh, I don't take it for granted. Well, <laughs> Well, no, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. Never do that. Never do that. Probably someone, you know, will listen to this podcast and say, well, you know what? That's not true. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Right. Okay. So, uh, so the pandemic has been a challenge. It's been a challenge for you. It's been a challenge for the people working with you. And it's been a challenge actually for the whole world. So is there any other challenge even greater than the pandemic that you have faced in your career? Oh, I mean, I don't know if they're greater, but the, you know, yeah, there's a, t there's a lot. And, and specifically in our space and in, in the cybersecurity space, there's a, there's a, a, a deficit of, of talent. Uh, and so there's, a, it, it's mm. hard to, to recruit and retain people. You know, my staff, they're getting, they're getting job offers every day. <laughs> <laughs> and, and some of them probably pay better than we pay them. And so it's like, we have to have a reason for them to, say no to those things right and uh and that that goes back to the the culture and values um it has to be a reason that they want to stay here it, sometimes it's monetary Every, everybody in the company has stock in the company and so they want they want that value too but but it has to be bigger than money because that you know traditionally money is not a great motivator um but uh yeah so th that i mean the, the the talent shortages have been a real has been a real uh challenge for us and i think for basically most of the companies in the cybersecurity space um, as well as the enterprises, for sure. Okay, but you know, and other other challenges, I guess, you know, this this challenge most probably has been, you can classify as a success. I mean, you, people are still working uh, in group sense, they're not leading, they're motivated, as you said earlier, so that's that's a good thing. What about failures? Can you, can you tell us, you know, an event that didn't end up well or not as suspected? Oh, there's a, there's a there's a lot. <laughs> if we learn from our failures, Stefano, I'm a genius. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I, so we all are. Yeah, I've, I've made a bunch of them. I'm, I, I mean, I just picking kind of randomly. Um, I do think the some of the early um, 
bad hires that we made, bad culture fit hires that we made caused a lot of damage um, for morale and, and, and for the team. And I think we lost, uh, we lost, there, there was collateral damage where we lost other team members that were perfectly fine, but because of, you know, one or two individuals behavior caused an issue there. Um, we, we had a, a, a very large partnership uh, that blew up uh, in our face and, and we lost that overnight. There's a great picture of one of my team members um, posing next to me while I'm on the floor in a conference room like this. And I was crying. <laughs> you talk about being vulnerable in front of your team. I literally was on the floor on my back crying. And uh, she took a selfie smiling and doing this with me crying on the floor. It was a great picture. <laughs> it, but it and that was the moment that this partnership basically dissolved and we didn't, it was, we were sort of blindsided by it. Um, and so, you know, the mistake we made there was, you know, the, 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 the agreements that we entered into for that allowed that to happen. We weren't smart about how we entered into that agreement and we ended up hurting as a result uh, pretty, but we learned, we learned a lot and we're not going to do that again. <laughs> Okay, so you know you learn, and this is lesson learned is always um, an important step. Of you know when when someone comes out of a from a failure, how you know? But how do you do you deal with failure in in more like an emotional sense, or also how do you transmit to the to the team the lesson learned? That is uh, something I struggle with almost on a daily basis because you want, I want to live the values also of transparency and, um, you know, honesty. Uh, but you're also trying to, to keep the team motivated. So there are, there are certain, there's a, there's a, there's a limit to the transparency you can afford uh, as a leader. So what I try to do is push that boundary as far as I can without, you know, you know without, scaring everyone but when we do make a mistake it, it is it is customary for me to to get in front of the whole team and and talk about it pretty openly and um and sometimes i don't know how how to fix it and sometimes i don't know exactly how you know we could have done it differently in the beginning at least not initially and i i will admit that <laughs> and and sometimes i'll solicit their feed you know I'll, I'll often i'll solicit their feedback like guys you know there's a lot of smart people here if you have ideas on how we can improve or, or, or avoid this, you know, tell me because I'm not perfect. I'm far from it. I'm, I'm just a human, you know? <laughs> well, that's, that's part of being vulnerable, right? As you said earlier, you know, and how do you feel when you expose yourself to Good. your team? Good. Good. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's, um, it's actually going back to the workout stuff. It's like when you, you know, David Goggins yelled at me to work out. I knew that morning when I was, I said, I just don't feel like doing it. I knew that after I did it, I would feel great. I knew that, but I still was like not talking to it. So I had to have David yell at me, but, but, <laughs> but uh, um, it's the same thing with, with being honest and transparent in a, in a difficult situation for me. It's the same thing. You don't want to do it. It sounds terrible. It's going to be embarrassing, you know, but after you do it, it's it's so much better, and um, and I also think it, it helps reinforce the culture when I do those things. It's like if all you hear from me is positivity a hundred percent of the time, you know I'm lying, because that is not life. <laughs> that is not real life, right? You know I'm lying, and there's I've worked for people like this that are just amazing positive people, but you know that they're spinning the story right to to make it sound better than it is, and uh, so we you know I'm, and I've I've been guilty of that, and actually. One of the best things about the culture at Group Sense is the team feels um, comfortable challenging me on that. So I, I, I've had a team member call me up and say, Curtis, the, I believe the thing that you just said on that call was exaggerated. And I don't think that that's in your character. And I think it could potentially cause harm. And I just wanted to make you aware of that. And I told him, I think it's beautiful that you felt like you could say that to me and, and, and I'm, and I take it to heart. Right. And so it, it's, it's a, it's a delicate thing, you know? <laughs> well, but it's beautiful that you accept you're open-minded to critiques from your people, you know, and, and actually you listen to them with intent of listening. That is so important 
And what do you think is the effect that you have on them, you know, being able to talk to you openly? Mostly positive. Um, you know, they, they feel like I'm not, um, you know, you, there, there are different kinds of leaders. Everybody's an individual, but there are different kind of categories of leaders, I think. And I've worked for a number of them. And um, there, there's sort of these uh, leaders that are on a pedestal. They're not approachable. They're not they're they they almost seem inhuman right they're they're you know the, those are some of the the silicon valley you know ceo types that are kind of on a pedestal you can't reach them can't go in their office <laughs> um i th i think that that de sort of detaches the the employees from the mission of the business because that person is 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 intricately tied to the 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 brand and the business as i am i am you know almost to a fault tied to the brand um that behavior, that unapproachability actually affects how the employees look at the company as a whole. Um, it has a downside to being being so approachable because what I do have is, you know, I, I do get a lot of uh, calls that maybe that they shouldn't have made, you know, like they, they, they've got problems that they could have solved instead of bringing them to me. <laughs> and I do push back, but it, but it takes time. You know, I have to have the conversation. And, um, and one of the critiques, uh, my chief operating officer, uh, has, um, and I haven't exactly figured out what he wants me to do with this. He hasn't given me suggestions. He just has the critique, but basically he says, you know, nobody at group sense wants to disappoint you. Nobody at group sense wants to, to, to tell, you no, they don't want to tell you no, and they don't want to disappoint you. Um, and you know, I'm trying to figure out how to be better at that. I, I don't know exactly how we got it. It wasn't deliberate, um, how we got in that situation. Uh, but I, but but I do think that that they do feel comfortable calling and and and, and talking to me about my behavior, but also their problems and, and things like that. And, and I guess when someone comes and say hey, they, don't, they don't want to disappoint you, it, it is also a way to put pressure on you because uh, uh, I'm assuming and I assure them. But uh, yeah. I guess you feel like you cannot disappoint them as well. It's like oh my god, I I am the man and I am responsible for this thing, right? Right. And there's a there's a bar that that has been set for, you know, for me that keeps getting <laughs> pushed up higher and um, higher. Yeah, yeah. Um it, it it's funny even this week we had a we had an all hands meeting and I didn't make it because I had a conflict. And more than one team member sent me a message on our chat tool saying, "Are you okay?" <laughs> that's beautiful like, yeah no no i just sometimes i have other meetings guys like I, it, <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know, they, they, they notice they notice when i'm not present they notice when i'm you know they can t they can i i'm i'm a pretty bad bullshitter <laughs> so I, they can tell <laughs> they can tell when i'm upset and when i'm you know it's it's i'm pretty pretty face value <laughs> So you, you don't you don't play poker, right? You, you don't have no. a poker face. I'd be terrible. <laughs> okay, okay. So you mentioned your past experiences with you know when you were a team member and you had bosses, mm -hmm. um, and you say something that disappointed you. Which was the most disappointing experience you had in your in your career? The most disappointing. Um, let's say the most disappointing person, boss that you had. Oh. Why, no names, please. Yeah, I mean, I, I, so I would say, before I answer that, I would say that I'm pretty judgy and, and, and to a fault. Like, I, I think um, I often, I think this is probably human nature. I often hold others to the bar, you know, to, to, the, to the, the ruler that I measure myself with. And when I don't think that they're, and I, I don't even have a full picture, it's not even fair, but I, 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 I've been, so the, the, I guess what I'm saying is I've been disappointed probably by my own measure uh, by many, many people I've worked with and for. <laughs> um, but uh, I think, you know, I worked for a tech company that was, that's quite successful. And I, I went through their, their, um, their IPO, uh, their initial public offering. It was very successful. The, some of the leadership of that company um, I got to the point where I, it's, it's the polar opposite of group sense where, where I got to the point where I could not trust the words that came out of their mouth. Um, and it, it had cost me quite literally money, uh, because, you know, at the time I was running a sales organization, um, 
you know, because I was misled about what, what they could and couldn't support or what, what the product would and wouldn't do. And, th and they just consistently uh, misinformed. And, and so that, that was extremely, you know, hurt. It hurt. It hurt to like not be able to count on them. <laughs> and it, the, the dichotomy of the, that same person, you know, in, in my tactical interaction with them, then standing, you know, on a stage in front of the whole company and, 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 and having this sort of other persona uh, just seemed uh, very hypocritical. And it, yeah. And it's part of the reason why I didn't stay at that company. It was, it was, it was time to leave. And, and, and frankly, that kind of experience dr very much drove the, the way that we built the culture at group sense is it's just like, I don't want, I don't want that. I don't want, you know, different levels so of, that, that of one secrets was secrets and, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. So that was like a defining moment in your, in your path to, you know, being the person you are, right. It was like understanding that the environment was not fit for you. Yeah. And I mean, the, the thing that's kind of a, kind of a screwed up about that is those people are extremely successful with that model. They're extremely successful. They're very wealthy. And they, and, and so, you know, it's, it's hard to reconcile that when you see like, well, this is just really poor behavior, but they, you know, it doesn't seem but, to harm their, their well being. <laughs> how, how, it depends on how you want to measure success. You know, if you want to measure success from the bank account, probably sure they, they, they were, but you know, if you want to measure success with other instruments, honor, want, like honor, integrity, right? <laughs> Yes, I agree. Well, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You know, and, and I come from an environment when this happens a lot. So, okay, um, okay, let's let's switch a little bit. We've been working a lot about about your uh, the, the group sense, you as a leader in group sense, and since we mentioned earlier your passion for motorbikes, you know, that's let's go there. Let's jump on the motorbike. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Or you're gonna feel more comfortable there, and yeah. uh, and do you say that you organize rallies and and meetings, and meetups with a uh, you know large group of people going there? You said that you were the president of the BMW chapter in Washington D.C., right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, what, what are the skills as a leader, as a the president of the chapter? What are the skills you need to have people come and enjoy the ride and be part yeah. of the group actually i mean those those are similar to i think similar to sales skills i will say that you know that 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 chapter that motorcycle chapter is a 501c3 nonprofit it's a it's an organization so it has it has a board it has finances you know it has obligations um and so uh one of the things i i picked up very quickly is it's extremely difficult to be a leader at an organization that is primarily made up of volunteers. <laughs> Cause everybody right. means well, everyone means well, and they say they will help or they say, well, but in the end uh, it, it's about maybe 30, 40% of what you expected. And, um, and so what, what I ended up doing right or wrong is, is running interference. So, you know, where, where they, where they fell short, I would swoop in and take over and, that that in 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 the day, in my day job that's a really bad trait, <laughs> but um, I didn't have a choice uh, with with the motorcycle club. But to, to getting the people together um, is it's it's a sales. It's similar to sales. Uh, a little bit of you know sales and marketing mixed in. Um, you know you it, like like sales. You have to give them a why, right? And the why has to be compelling. Um, and uh, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of whys. There's a lot of good whys on why you would want to get together with other motorcyclists and 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 ride together or camp together or you know those sorts of things. And so just being able to 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 distill those things down and communicate them uh, well and through all of the different mediums, right? So including Facebook and all those things, uh, a little bit of technical know-how as well. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, you don't pay them, right? So they don't have to show up. Basically, if they right. they choose not to, they they will never come. <laughs> right. So like, okay, yeah, yeah, I understand. So what is the lesson you learn from this experience? You know, in the uh, as a president of the of the of the chapter. Um, 
Well, if I was going to do it again, and I'm not, they, they've, they've actually asked me. <laughs> <laughs> so the lesson if learned gonna, is that I'm not going to do it. <laughs> yeah, if I was going to do it again, um, one, of the, one of the mistakes I made, uh, I think, is, is asking some of my friends to volunteer uh, for positions. And when they didn't deliver, mm -hmm. not only did I have the problem of them not delivering, but I was, I was hurt personally. I took it personal uh, that they, they didn't deliver. Um, and the fact is, is they were behaving like every other volunteer, but they just happened to be my close friends, <laughs> right? Which is they, they, they overcommit and then deliver. Um, and so, you know, I would, I would certainly change that. And I, I do think, uh, and this is before I, I did this before I, uh, you know, group sense really took off. It was kind of happened at the same time. Um, and, you know, I do think I did a poor job setting like responsibilities and expectations for the board and for the team. Um, and, and they, and they saw no consequences for not delivering. Um, so I, I, because I ran in and did it all right. Um, so during the rally, no joke during the rally, you know, when the toilets backed up, I was, I was the one in the, in the restroom with a plunger and a broom and a, and a squeegee like cleaning, you know, it, it, just I, everything you could think of. Like we ran out of firewood. I had to go, you know, down the street and buy a bunch of chopped wood and, you know, just everything. And it, those are things that the volunteer had been doing, not the president of the club. <laughs> um, yeah. And what one evening we ran out of alcohol. That's a real problem at a motorcycle rally when you run out of alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go, I had to go solve that one. Um, but uh, anyway. Okay. Okay. So a lot of a lot of lesson learned, and that's why you know you know not gonna do it again. That's what you said. So, but you know, when we talk yeah. about leadership. Yeah. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is also the personal leadership, and we touch upon a few things, you know, like self awareness and, and things like that. But I want to go on one of your passions that you have, and you mentioned already that it's fitness and you know health in general. What are what are the, the uh, the characteristics, if you want, that you need to have to be. You said in the, the last fifteen years, if I'm not wrong, you said that you've been pretty pretty focused on your health, right? What what do you need to get there? Yeah. Discipline. <laughs> Basically, lots of discipline because the the health part is not just you know lifting weights or going for a jog, but it's also what what you put in your mouth, <laughs> like what you eat. Um, and, uh, you know, other, other behaviors, uh, I still have a, a few vices, coffee, for example, but, um, yeah, so you know, you, the self-awareness is important because you can lie to yourself about whether you did the workout correctly or enough, right. You can, you can totally convince yourself, uh, a, a convenient answer to that question. So self-awareness, but also just discipline, um, making sure you get up and, and, and do the thing every day. And, uh, that, that's the hardest part. And that's, I think that's the hardest part for most people is they can talk themselves out of it. Um, yeah, and so part of the, part of that is like I said, for people coming to motorcycle events is you have to have a why, right. And the why is going to drive, is going to drive that discipline. Uh, if, if you use it correctly, that tool correctly, it's going to drive that discipline. You know, as Simon Sinek, I don't know if you know him, but he's used to say, start with why. You know, of course, it's a, yeah, yeah. this is a mantra for, for marketing, but not only apparently, also for self-motivation and, and, and discipline, right? So what is the motivate you the most in your personal life? In my personal life? Wow. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm unique in that I'm... Uh, you know, I'm seeing someone, but I'm, I'm not married. I was, I was, I was, I was married and with my ex for 18 years. So I did have a long-term relationship, but that's, that's been gone for a while. Um, and, uh, I don't have kids. I don't have any pets. I don't have house plants. <laughs> I have virtually no responsibilities in my personal life other than myself. <laughs> so where, where a lot of people would be motivated by their kids, um, or, you know, by their family or things. I, I have, obviously I have a family. I, my parents are still alive. I have sisters and a sister and some nieces that I care deeply about. Um, but I don't have, it's not, it's not my nuclear family. It's not somebody I come home to every night. Um, 
you know, I think primarily I'm, I'm motivated by, you know, recognizing that I've only got a certain amount of time, you know, on this planet. And I want to maximize that for myself and uh, for the people who, who I associate with. Um, and so to do that, I want to be the best possible version of myself. And that, that's really the, one of the whys is it's, 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 it's motivating. And that discipline that you use, uh, or that I use for, for fitness and all of these other things, like the, the, the regular meditation sessions, the, the journaling, that same discipline applies elsewhere in, in life and, uh, and, in, at, at work. Right. So, um, you quickly learn that, you know, the thing that you don't want to do, or you think you can't do, you absolutely can. And you should, and, and, you know, having this inner argument with yourself about not doing it is completely waste of calories. And so, you know, you, you, you can take that same discipline and apply it in, in things that, well, the types of things I'm talking about at work are like avoiding a difficult conversation or, you know, listening to the, the angry customer, uh, that you don't agree with, but you have to listen to, like, you, you're going to try to avoid those circumstances as long as possible or send someone else, you know, when it really needs to be you. Um, so basically recognizing that you can and should do the hard thing, even if you don't want to, you'll be okay. <laughs> you can apply that uh, discipline <laughs> elsewhere, right? So do, do you have like a, a quote, uh, like a mantra that you repeat yourself every day? Not, not every day. Um, I'm a big fan of Jane Hirschfeld. I don't know if you know her. She's a poet. Um, uh, actually, uh, I think this might be on my personal website because one of my favorite phrases from her is, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the exact way she says it, but she says basically Zen really comes down to two, Zen comes down to two things. Everything changes. Pay attention. That's it. <laughs> so, you know, getting one of the, the tenets, and, and I'm, I'm not a practicing Buddhist, but I read a lot of, about Eastern philosophy and, and Buddhism. And there are, there are things that I take from that. And, and one of the things is, um, you know, tying your self-worth or your happiness to something that is outside of your control is bad. And I include, for example, my health in that, right? Someday I'm not going to be able to do that workout. And I have to be okay with that, right? I can't tie my self-worth, my happiness to that. And uh, a lot of people tie their happiness to routines or, um, you know, th they expect something to happen. Every, you know, I, I have a family member who it, they, they've gotten to the point in their life where they just want to sit and watch TV. And anything that disrupts that, anything, upsets them immensely. I mean, if, you know, if, 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 if they have to take the car in for an oil change, it just really upsets them, right? And so this this idea that everything around you is going to change, and if you attach your 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 self worth or well being or happiness to to anything external, um, it, you're going to be upset a lot, <laughs> you know. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to be really aware of that. Yeah, I mean, I, as I said, I like the sentence, and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna remember this. I'm gonna write them on the the, the, the my my best quotes because it, it is important you know they used to say pantare everything flows everything changes and and you know you mentioned something that is like people most of people like to be in the comfort zone and there is no judgment in this i mean you want to be in your comfort zone and you want to watch your tv and that's what you prefer to do i'm, I'm fine with that it just right. um there is there there are just different approach to life that I guess to sure. that and it, that's the beautiful thing of talking with different people and exploring if you want different way of living this period we have on on this planet. Right. Right. All right, Carly. I I thank you very much. But I have the last question. You know, our time is almost over. But before we we say goodbye, I'm. What is the message you would like to give to a person approaching to you to say, you know, like, oh, I want to, I want to learn how to be a leader. What would you tell this person? Um, I think, uh, like I said, being a leader is a practice. So I would say deliberately practice, which means learn something new every day. 
study, uh, be self-reflective, be honest with yourself. I mean, that first and foremost, be honest with yourself. Um, understand your why uh, for everything you're doing. Un try, try to really understand your why. In, in, uh, in, I don't know if you're familiar with Six Sigma and, and lean manufacturing, but right, you know, the five whys, right? If you can ask yourself the question why five times, you're going to get an answer, a real answer, right? And you got to ask those <laughs> questions of yourself. Um, just like the like the young kids that you talked about, right? Like just keep asking why until you get to the the nugget, right? Um, so understand your why. Pra practice. Uh, so that the practice includes lifelong learning and reading. I, I read a lot, um, and uh, it, it it would help to have you know a mentor in mind as well, right? And someone that that you look up to that is is doing it, doing the leadership role in a way that you would want to fashion yourself. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. All right. So thank you very much, Carlos. Thank you very much for being with us for this hour. So and for all the wisdom that you share with us and your experience, and it's it's great. So I hope to meet you in person because we never met. <laughs> but yeah, you know, same. until next time. Thank you again. All right. Thank you.